The Bible reading comes from 1 Samuel, and the first bit is 1 to 8. There was a Benjamite, a man of standing, whose name was Kish, son of Abiel, the son of Zerah, the son of Becherath, the son of Aphia of Benjamin. Kish had a son named Saul, as handsome a young man as could be found anywhere in Israel, and he was a head taller than anyone else. Now the donkeys belonging to Saul's father, Kish, were lost. And Kish said to his son Saul, Take one of the servants with you and go and look for the donkeys. So he passed through the hill country of Ephraim and through the area around Salisha, but they did not find them. They went on into the district of Shalem, but the donkeys were not there. Then he passed through the territory of Benjamin, but they did not find them. When they reached the district of Zuth, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, let us go back, or my father will stop thinking about the donkeys and start worrying about us. But the servant replied, Look, in this town there is a man of God. He is highly respected, and everything he says comes true. Let's go there now. Perhaps he will tell us what way to take. Saul said to the servant, If we go, what can we give the man? The food in our sacks is gone. We have no gift to take to the man of God. What do we have? The servant answered him again. Look, he said, I have a quarter of a shekel of silver. I will give it to the man of God so that he will tell us what way to take. Verse 14 to 21. They went up to the town, and as they were entering it, there was Samuel coming towards them on his way up to the high place. Now the day before Saul came, the Lord had revealed this to Samuel. About this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin. Anoint him ruler over my people of Israel. He will deliver them from the hand of the Philistines. I have looked on my people, for their cry has reached me. When Samuel caught sight of Saul, the Lord said to him, This is the man I spoke to you about. He will govern my people. Saul approached Samuel in the gateway and asked, Would you please tell me where the seer's house is? I am the seer, Samuel replied. Go up ahead of me to the high place, for today you are to eat with me, and in the morning I will send you on your way and will tell you all that is in your heart. As for the donkeys you lost three days ago, do not worry about them, they have been found. And to whom is all the desire of Israel turned, if not to you and your whole family line? Saul answered, But am I not a Benjamite from the smallest tribe of Israel? And is not my clan the least of all the clans of the tribe of Benjamin? (coughs) Sorry. (coughs) Why do you say such a thing to me? Then Samuel took a flask of olive oil and poured it on Saul's head and kissed him, saying, Has not the Lord anointed you ruler over his inheritance? Verse 9 to 10. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart, and all those signs were fulfilled that day when he and his servant arrived at Gabeah. A procession of prophets met him, The Spirit of God came powerfully upon him, and he joined in their prophesying. Verse 17 to 27. Samuel summoned the people of Israel to the Lord at Mizpah and said to them, This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I brought Israel up out of Egypt, 
and I delivered you from the power of Egypt and all the kingdoms that have opposed you. But you have now rejected your God, who saves you out of all your disasters and calamities. And you have said, no, appoint a king over us. So now present yourself before the Lord by your tribes and clans. When Samuel had all Israel come forward by tribes, the tribe of Benjamin was taken by Lot. Then he brought forward the tribe of Benjamin, clan by clan, and Matri's clan was taken. Finally, Saul, son of Kish, was taken. But when they looked for him, he was not to be found. So they inquired further of the Lord, Has the man come here yet? And the Lord said, Yes, he's hidden himself among the supplies. They ran and brought him out. And as he stood among the people, he was a head taller than any of the others. Samuel said to all the people, Do you see the man the Lord has chosen? There is no one like him among all the people. Then the people shouted, Long live the king! Samuel explained to the people the rights and duties of kingship. He wrote them down on a scroll and deposited it before the Lord. Then Samuel dismissed the people to go to their own homes. Saul also went to his home in Gebir, accompanied by valiant men whose hearts God had touched. But some scoundrels said, How can this fellow save us? They despised him and bought him no gifts, but Saul kept silent. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, Victoria, for reading that so ably, particularly with, particularly with all the difficult names and places. Um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We know there are parts of it that uh, we perhaps don't read as often as others. And so this morning, as we look at a less familiar passage, perhaps for most of us, I pray, Father, that you would reveal what you might be saying, not just about the passage and the, and the story that we find here, but what you might be speaking to us personally from these verses. Because, Lord, we do believe that every word of scripture is there in order that you can Bring your word into our hearts and teach us the things that you want us to be doing. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, <clears throat> I don't apologise for such a long passage. Um, it could have been even longer because I could have asked Victoria to read the whole of those two chapters. But we managed to find a way to, to remove some of the verses in order that we would not lose sense of it, but still keep it slightly shorter. So... Yeah, once again, my thanks to you, Victoria, for all that. <clears throat> First of all, a very quick uh, review of where we've got to so far. Um, Samuel's birth, at the very beginning, chapter one, uh, was special because his mother, Hannah, couldn't conceive. And in the process of asking God for help uh, with conception, she promised... Um, that she would give him over to the Lord and he would serve God for out, through his life. That was the first part. And then, and then that happened and she was true to her word and he served under the priest, the high priest of Eli. But then from a very young age, he was called by God. God spoke to him uh, in the night. You remember that story if you're with, with us. And God gave him a revelation that the whole of the existing spiritual leadership was basically corrupt, and God made it very clear that he was going to be the one who was going to be set over and given the responsibility. The baton was passing from one um, group of people to Samuel. Last time, and it was a long, long time later than that passage just read, Samuel was already an old man, and... Uh, there was once again a spiritual crisis. His sons haven't, hadn't fulfilled the roles that God had given to them. It wasn't quite so bad as with Eli and the priests the other, and his sons, but it was still rough. And so at that point, 
it was the people, the elders, the leaders of the tribes who said, you know, we, we need to do something about this. We want a king. We want to be like other nations. And they asked God and they asked Samuel for the king. Um, both Samuel and God agreed with each other that it wasn't a good idea. But because they insisted, that was what they were going to get. And they were told the, what the consequences would be, but they didn't change their minds. And that's why we get the story that we've been looking at today. This story uh, from verse 1 of chapter 9 to perhaps verse 1 of chapter 10 is quite a long-winded tale uh, about Saul eventually meeting Samuel and being anointed with a view to becoming the king of the tribes of Israel. <laughs> I don't know about you, sometimes it, scripture really makes me laugh. It really does. And I was laughing as I was listening to it there again because... What is it? Is this story about the anointing of a king or is it about lost donkeys? <laughs> you know, I thought to myself, I could have headed this section, deity and donkeys, because there is much, as much said about these donkeys. They keep coming back, they keep figuring again and again. But it's interesting, it's because of the lost donkeys that this whole thing takes place in the first place. How imaginative is God? <laughs> How imaginative. And yet, also, how mundane is the whole set of circumstances. Anyway, backing up just a little bit. This, this, pith, this chapter, these verses, they open with the description of Saul in verse 2. A handsome young man, as could be found anywhere in Israel, and that he was a head taller than anyone else. This is a king, isn't it? Isn't this a king? Stands out, proud, you know. He'll do well. God's, God has chosen well with this man, so you would think. Kingly material, got the physique, physique for it, got the presence about him, would be admired by the people. So there doesn't seem to be any doubt, you know, that this will be the person who will be the leader of these tribes in the coming years. And yet, what is Saul doing when we're told about that? He's out searching for donkeys <laughs> with his servant. And they've walked miles. I tried to find a map somewhere of, of, of how far they've walked because I didn't know any of these places that they, that they were around. And it, it seems, you know, there's always somebody out there on the internet that's done, who's got enough time on their hands to do some research. And having looked at this particular piece of um, material, it did seem quite, quite reasonable, but they probably walked many, many miles, probably well over 20 <coughs> miles, chasing these donkeys <laughs> around the countryside. I mean, they were fit as well by the sound of it. Uh, you know, they were, they were just looking anywhere they could. And in the end, quite rightly, there's this question, you know, if we carry on doing this for any longer, it's not going to be donkeys that are our father is worried about, it's going to be us. <laughs> if you can't just phone home and tell them where you are, at least that's a good sign in Saul, that he's aware that other people will have concerns as well about things. It's not self-obsessed. And so what they're going to do? They make one more attempt, one more effort um, to find the donkeys. There's this man of God they've heard of in one of the local villages a prophet, a seer, someone who could help them perhaps search donkeys. Well, it sounds a little bit below um, the role of a prophet particularly, but maybe it's worth the bash. And so they manage to find some money and they go to the prophet, the prophet Samuel. God, in the usual way that he works, is preparing for that visit. At the same time as they're deciding to go and find who they discover is Samuel, Samuel is being spoken to by God and given a revelation that Benjamin from Benjamin, who's looking for donkeys, <laughs> a good way of, of making sure you get the right guy, and we are in the land um, of, the, of the tribe of Benjamin, so you need something else to clarify it's the right person, but he would come the next day and he 
Samuel is told, will deliver his people. Verse 16, about this time tomorrow, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, anoint him ruler over my people Israel. He will deliver them from the hand of the Philistines. I, will, I have looked on my people, for their cry has reached me. You know, this must, might have been a mundane situation as far as the donkeys were concerned, but it wasn't mundane in any sense of the world as far as the future of the tribes of Israel is concerned. God is creating a miraculous set of circumstances that ensures that nobody could dispute that Saul was the person who would be anointed as the king of the tribes of Israel. I, I've, I've heard myself saying this a number of times recently, but time and time again I've said, and I've heard myself say it from the front here, that God takes the ordinary things and makes them extraordinary. I, I honestly have lost count. I, I should go back in my notes and see how often I've said that recently. It just feels like a, a theme that comes back to, to remind us. I guess you'd probably say your life is ordinary. Most of us probably would. So ordinary is what God takes and uses. He's interested in you and he's interested in me. He's interested in the ordinariness of life because those are the things that he can work with. Nothing is useless. No one is useless to God. You know, we're talking about someone becoming a king here and we might think, well, that's got absolutely nothing to do with me. It's got nothing to do with my set of circumstances. Well, no, it hasn't. But yes, it has. Because at that moment in time, Saul was doing ordinary things, chasing donkeys. Well, maybe that's not very ordinary, but you know what I mean. You might be chasing children or grandchildren. or You, don't, you, you, can, see the, you can see the comparison, can't you, here? Now, I'm not suggesting that God is going to make you the leader of our nation, but we should never doubt that God has his eyes open and on us for things that he feels we can do for him in the kingdom in the same way that he spotted that Saul was going to be a man. You're never a nobody as far as God is concerned. Never. And just in the context of that, remember what James, those of you who were here last week, remember what James was saying about reminding us of who we are in Christ, our identity. I remind you of some of, that, some of the words that he, he spoke from. Yet now... He has reconciled you to himself through the death of Christ in his physical body. As a result, he's brought you into his own presence and you are holy and blameless as you stand before him without a single fault. But you must con continue to believe this truth and stand firmly in it. Don't drift away from the assurance you received when you heard the good news. God has called us, has made us special, holy in his sight. We are not ordinary anymore. We are extraordinary. In our passage, we are about to read that Saul would be anointed to be involved with a lifelong task of service. Friends, you and I, we've also been anointed, would you believe, for a lifelong task of service to God when we've accepted Jesus Christ as our Lord and Saviour. Are we constantly alert for the next assignment that he might have for us? I hope so. So in the first verse of chapter 10, Saul is finally anointed and he will eventually, or shortly, become king of the tribes of Israel. God has literally ordained it. And so we move on. We move on to the second part um, of, the, of the verses that um, Victoria kindly read to us, verses 9 and 10, and then 17 to 26. We didn't have a chance to read those first um, verses from chapter 10, but they are the story of God giving um, various uh, promises, if you like, or revelations to Saul that would assure him that what he wants to do is right and will happen. And this is all summed up in verse 9. 
when we read that as Saul turned to leave Samuel, God changed Saul's heart and all these signs were fulfilled that day. If you want to read the signs, you want to know what they were, and I really encourage you to do that. Go back and reread the whole chapters because there is a chance that, the, because of, I've picked those bits out, that you may misunderstand something. So it would be great to read those two chapters fully again and see the whole context. But through the remainder of the middle section of chapter 10, again, we didn't read this section, and I would encourage you to do that, um, here we read that Saul behaves like a prophet. The Spirit of God comes upon him. The power of God is with him. Also, by the way, we find out the donkeys have been found. Um, so I'm sure that will please some people. Again, again, quite bizarre. But however we might think about the story and the course that this story is taking, it seems it is moving towards the coronation of King Saul. And we take up the story again in verse 17. But at that point, we discover there's a bit of a hiccup. Imagine the situation, if you will. Uh, Samuel has called all the tribes together and he's in, ready to um, enthrone the new monarch. The vast majority of the people don't have a clue yet who that person is. He knows, obviously. And they go through a process of drawing lots and discerning what God is saying in this whole situation. And slowly but surely through the tribes, through the clans, through the families. In verse 21, we read that Saul, the son of Kish, is chosen to be king. Wonderful. Praise God. We've got a king. We know who it's going to be. Bring him forward. He's nowhere to be seen. So we're told in verse 22, actually before that, they're wondering, you know, hasn't he arrived yet? Has he got lost again? <laughs> is he out searching for donkeys? No, we don't think that, but... <laughs> Where is this man? This tall, handsome guy. He can't hide very easily. He's a head above everyone else. But he's not here. And so we're told in verse 22, they inquired further of the Lord. I wonder how they did that. Presumably through Samuel and the other prophets who were there. But very quickly and very clearly, in the second half of verse 22, they're told this, the Lord said, yes, he has hidden himself among the supplies. What's going on? What, what, what's, what's Saul up to? Has he, got, has he got cold feet all of a sudden? Has he realised what it's going to involve for him? Has he some doubt about God's decision? Does not he feel that he's up to the job? And even all the signs that he's received along the way, are they no benefit for him? We're actually not given any reason why Saul did this. But it doesn't bode very well for the future, does it? Really. Maybe he had just too long to think about it and was making some feeble attempt, at least, to avoid being crowned. Saul so, agreed to something that he later regretted. I don't know about you, but I've done that many times in my life. Things I've either promised to do and subsequently thought that's going to be too difficult or I really, you know, don't fancy that doing that. Maybe they, they weren't anything as great as um, agreeing to be a king, of course. Um, but I can think of other situations that, were, for me at least, were, were, ba were bad and I didn't want to do. And sometimes I tried to sidestep them or get out of them and not do them. We've all been there. We've all tried to do that. I'd be surprised if any of us haven't. For Saul, it's the equivalent of putting his head in the sand, or in his case, hiding himself in the supplies. For you and me, it could be trying to simply brush things away or forget about them until somebody comes along and reminds us, of course, most notably of, would be God. You know, a much better approach for Samuel, uh, sorry, for um, 
saw would have been to speak to Samuel, to have gone to him and said, look, can we inquire of the Lord again? Can we, can we, can we really make sure this is what God wants, if that was the reason for his concern? There's nothing wrong with that. We know of lots of biblical characters who went back to God, double-check. No one could have blamed him for wanting to do that if he was anxious about the role. Instead, he just hid. He put his head in the sand. And that's true for us. You know, if we face difficult situations, if we've promised things, if, we, if, we've, if we're in a, in a place where, you know, we're, we're worried about doing the next thing that God has said to us to do, then go back to him. Ask him again. He will never, he will never mind repeating himself. To help us in our walk, in our faithful walk of service with him, there is nothing worse than hearing from God and then doing nothing about it. When the people couldn't find Saul, they started that hunt for him. But before they did that, they paused and prayed and sought God. And the result? Far quicker. I, this is a trivial thing, but I've, I've discovered that when I lose things in the house, <laughs> if I say to the Lord, can you help me find this? I usually find it more quickly. That's so trivial. I... I that is, almost embarrasses me to have, have mentioned it, but yeah, those things, if we ask God about anything, he will, he will always be willing even if, to, to reply, even if it's to say, don't be silly, for whatever reason. He will always do that. It requires a change of habit, it requires a change of attitude. It requires us to be patient sometimes, also to change our decision-making processes. Let's not do, let's not have the approach that Saul had here. Let's have the approach that the people had on this occasion. It was the right way around. And then there's one last thing. How am I doing? The last two verses, 26 and 27. So the whole... Um, eventually the whole coronation happens. I can't imagine it was terribly grand in those days, not like King Charles III. But no doubt it happened in some shape or form. We're not given much detail about it. And then everyone praises God and thanks him, and then they all go home. <laughs> Literally, that's what it says. They all went home. But in the process then, there's a rather telling sentence at that point and let me find it for you so I can read it but some troublemakers it was rabbles I think in the version we had up there said how can this fellow save us they despised him and brought him no gifts but Saul kept silent there's an ominous air over this coronation. There are already those who can see, for whatever reason, maybe it's because their tribe wasn't the tribe that was given authority. Maybe it was because they could see and saw a man who wasn't really godly or wasn't really up to the role, even though he looked the part. There's an ominous here, a group here, a discontented remnant, if you like, who presumably had quite some influence. We're not told exactly who they are, but I'm sure they wouldn't have been mentioned if they were just casual farm labourers. They found some reason to despise Saul. And this would be something, of course, that would continue throughout his reign in one form or another. But saying that, opposition is actually part of life. It doesn't matter who we are or what we do. If particularly, I'm talking about what we do, if we're trying to fulfil the will of God, then you can guarantee there'll be opposition from some shape or form. We should never be surprised or discouraged or even afraid when that comes along. We should simply be those who endeavour to serve God in the things that he's asked us to do 
and in the way that he wants to, whatever the difficulties might be. To begin at least, to begin with at least, Saul's uh, authority was powerful. It was only later that things started to go wrong. Despite the opposition, he took the role that he was given. Now Saul was far from perfect, yet God was still able to take this broken individual and use him for his purposes. And we should take real encouragement for that. You know, no matter what we've done in the past, no matter what our experiences have been, no matter what our abilities are, or lack of them, God can and will use us if we offer ourselves to his service. You know, there's only one thing that God actually needs to be able to use us. That's willingness. Saul nearly came unstuck because there was that one point there when he was hiding when it looked like the willingness had gone. Thankfully it didn't. That's what God is looking for from us, a willingness. So will you let him anoint you as leader in your place of influence, wherever that might be, whether it's in your home or your family or your street or your job or somewhere else, wherever it might be, will you be anointed for that role? Let's pray. Deity and donkeys. Lord, you were in this story. You were in this saga. You put everything together to make it happen. It isn't just a fun story. It's a part of the history of your people. It's part of our history. Lord, it demonstrates for us how we can see you in the everyday things. In our everyday lives. Help us to take from this story the challenge for us to live for you in the same way that you called us all. You call us, you call us all to serve you faithfully each day. And in so doing, Lord, proclaim your glory. Thank you. Amen.